Right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all very much for uh, coming along and attending our uh, Recollect webinar today. Um, I'd like to begin first by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking to you from. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which each of our online uh, attendees are living and working um, from today as well. And also wish to pay uh, my respects to their elders past and present. I wish to also extend that same respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, with us here today as well. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Richard Wilson. I'm the Business Development Manager for Datacom IT. And joining me also today from Datacom IT is Roger Mills. Um, Roger is our Recollect consultant and um, is our, a resident expert on Recollect and also works with our clients on the implementation uh, of the Recollect solution. And Christine Chetafati uh, is with us as well, who's our marketing manager from Datacom IT and has organised today's uh, webinar. So thank you for that, Christine. Um, our special guests, of course, um, is uh, or are Martha Follestad and Pierchat Ratana, uh, who are both digital collection librarians from the University of Sydney. And um, they will be showcasing both their Recollect site and um, their special collection um, around uh, lockdowns um, today. So just by a bit of a, a way of an, an overview and, and I guess an introduction um, to Recollect, for those that are not aware, Datacom IT is the Australian um, sales and implementation partner for Recollect. Uh, so Recollect itself is a software as a service solution that was developed by a company not dissimilar to us as in Datacom IT in New Zealand, um, who first developed it for their clients that they were providing digitization services for and uh, in the library sector that were looking for an online solution to both um, store and share their, their digital assets. Um, the success of, uh, of that product within New Zealand and their expansion into Australia meant that they wanted to take the product uh, internationally. And at that time, um, Datacom IT came on board as that partner um, for the sales and implementation. Um, so that's sort of, I guess, a bit of a background on who Datacom IT are and our relationship with Recollect as the software as a service provider. Um, but today's uh, webinar is, is in two main parts. Um, the first part will be um, provided by Roger from Datacom IT, giving everyone a bit of an overview and an introduction of Recollect um, with a bit of a focus on some of our existing uh, university clients who are using Recollect here in Australia, so showcasing their sites as part of that um, demonstration. And the second part will be that presentation uh, by both Martha and Peer Chat uh, in, on their Recollect site and, um, and how they've um, their special collection there from, from lockdowns. Um, just a bit of, uh, I guess, housekeeping. There is, if you use, people who haven't used uh, this particular webinar before, there is a chat function. Um, and I really encourage people if um, throughout the presentation, if you think of a query or a question, please jump on board and put it into that chat area. And um, we will go back and review each of those at the end, either at the end of Roger's presentation, if, um, if it's appropriate, or right at the very end. And we'll address all of those, uh, all of those queries for questions that you have. Um, so I guess without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Roger um, to commence that um, presentation on the on the Recollect solution itself. Thanks very much, Richard. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much. It's, uh, look, it's great to have the opportunity to give you an overview of Recollect before Martha and Peer Chat present the, the work that they've been doing at uh, University of Sydney Digital Collections. Uh, look, some of you might know about Recollect already and, and others may not. Um, so what I'm going to do is just provide a, a broad high level demonstration of some of the key features uh, and how it can be employed by university libraries and archives to um, showcase your special collections for academic students uh, and alumni alike. Uh, I should say too that my, my own background is actually in tertiary education and libraries, uh, having worked as an academic in digital humanities at uh, University of Technology Sydney for many years before moving into public library sector um, and then I took my role up here as the digital preservation consultant at Datacom IT and as Richard said I do manage the uh, Recollect implementation so um, I've got a good understanding now of the ways in which universities operate particularly archives and, and their uh, library collections uh, as well as what Recollect can offer in, in the way that um, uh, we create a, a collection management system for, for those archives. And look, I think Recollect is really um, pushing the envelope for 
um, how it can function not only as, a, as an academic resource and collections management system, uh, but also the way that it allows you to provide discoverability, access and engagement with particularly special collections um, through its linked uh, data model, which I'll speak about um, shortly. So Recollect is an online digital asset and collection management system as a unified platform. That's the best way to think about it. Um, it stores and manages uh, all of your digital assets and um, in a database as well as functioning as a, a community engagement solution. So it can provide your staff and students and alumni with a, a way to discover content through descriptive uh, metadata uh, and that linked metadata model that I'll be showing you uh, in a little bit. It also provides access by being able to um, view lots of different types of files and content in one platform uh, and from any internet connected device. Uh, and finally, and one of the most the strongest um, aspects of Recollect is its engagement tools, uh, which provide functions to enable researchers and staff to tag and comment on items uh, and share their knowledge and discoveries with their peers to provide contributions and enrich your collections um, by uploading their own content and really creating, I guess, a storehouse of peer reviewed um, knowledge. And of course, the database also allows you to manage your content into a workflow. Uh, as well as preserving archival material through um, the additional digital preservation module. So let's look at some of the basics. Uh, Recollect content is hosted in the cloud by Amazon Web Services and comes with unlimited storage capacity. Of course, you get a, a, a default uh, entry point of 500 gigabytes. Uh, there's no limit on the amount of users um, and it provides uh, tiered level access privileges to different levels of users to be able to edit and manage content, be that uh, ingesting data, um, moderating contributions, reporting of site statistics, analytics, with all the ability to be able to manage that into workflow. Uh, Martha and Peer Chat might speak to that in a little bit as well. Uh, it also has OM, OAI and PMH compatible um, metadata, metadata harvesting, um, and of course you can link that with the Trove API as well. Uh, and as I was just saying, it has that OAIS compliant uh, digital preservation module as well. We think that the key to Recollect's discoverability functions is its universal digital viewer, which basically allows you to view lots of different types of content, 3D content, audio video, uh, and then be able to caption tag and add, co add your comments to that content. Um, as well as georeferencing uh, geo functionality, which is integrated with the Google Maps API. And of course, this can all be accessed from any internet connected device. And I'll demonstrate these functions as we jump into uh, some live sites. What I thought we'd do is just um, have a look at some of these live sites, uh, have a look at the differences in the way that they've um, been laid out. And I should preface what I'm saying here uh, by uh, the fact that when uh, a client comes to us, we take them on a, a journey, uh, and a part of that journey is the discovery phase, which uh, entails a, a number of workshops and training sessions uh, in which we identify the key user groups as personas, uh, and then those personas really drive the rest of the implementation from the way that you lay your data out according to um, how you think your users or personas would like to discover content in your site, as well as the homepage configuration and, and how you lay out those widgets. And I guess suffice it to say, you, you will see some similar similarities in these sites because obviously the academic communities of all of the universities that I'm about to show you uh, have, I guess, a similar uh, cohort of, of personas. But let's start with um, Sydney, University of Sydney. Uh, what we see here is a, a customized header um, in which you can, which they link out to uh, individual collections and services that the university offer. Um, you've then got we, what we call the featured items widget. This featured items widget can take you straight through into a particular item itself, um, or it can be on a carousel in that it moves through uh, a number of different items that can be curated uh, over a period of time. And so you can always refresh your site as you've just seen there. Um, by adding different uh, user or, or node IDs uh, to, to the carousel widget. We've obviously got the um, search bar functionality underneath that, 
uh, with what we call browser widgets, which really identify particular types of formats that you can jump into. Um, again, this is really all focused toward the user community that uh, UCID felt they wanted to design their site toward. And they've got a very, very clean home page here with a series of uh, collection widgets, which just take you straight through to a particular collection, for instance, this medieval and an early uh, modern collection, um, which is a, a fascinating collection. And there's lots of really interesting content here. So I do um, uh, implore you to uh, have a look at uh, UCID's site because there's so much great content there. Obviously got at the bottom of that, they have um, a customized uh, footer uh, with lots of links out to different parts of the university as well. We can jump from there, but then straight into, say, the University of Newcastle's site. Um, obviously, the first thing you get there is the uh, cultural warnings. Um, they've got sort of a customized carousel widget here, which is moving through a lot faster than the, um, the, the widget collection widget, or rather the uh, featured items widget of the University of Sydney. Um, again, they've got their search bar directly underneath that, and their uh, browser widgets, got a welcome text. They go straight into their collection widgets after that, um, and they've added a, a user map or interactive user map at the bottom there too. Of course, that's slightly different again to the University of Waikato. Um, this is a different representation of those browser widgets. Again, they've got their collections uh, widgets underneath that and a browser map too. So these are two common functionalities that are coming across in those two universities. Jump across to the University of uh, Adelaide, um, again, they've gone for um, their uh, featured items widget with the uh, search bar underneath that. Only they've gone for what we describe as showcase widgets, which just basically take you through into a particular item within the collection. And uh, again, I reiterate that these can be curated uh, on a weekly or monthly basis to just keep your site looking um, quite fresh. So if you look through to the uh, Adelaidean here, um, you'll see all of the information about that series of um, new magazines uh, and of course all the metadata uh, outlined, outlaid on the, uh, the right hand side there. Um, underneath that with the University of Adelaide we've got what we call the topic widgets um, which allow you to explore again um, both types of collections but also topical um, collections and then they move into their their collection widgets themselves. And then you've got your um, customized uh, footer at the bottom there with all of those external links. Uh, so there's a broad overview of four uh, university sites that have had implementations over the, the recent years. Um, what I thought I might do now is just jump straight into um, some of the image and document view functionality and what you can achieve through displaying your items in, in these uh, in these ways. Here's an example of a, a map um, taken from, I think it's 1905 um, at the, of the Adelaide CBD. And the tool functions on the, the bottom here allow you to really zoom in, but as you can see, you can't quite see the, uh, the lot numbers of, of, of these uh, streets. So the zoom to 100% function allow you to really jump into this map in a lot more detail, as you can see there the uh, lot numbers become very much clearer and you get a real sense of um, the age of the document. Um, you, know, you can see little marks here and just get a sense of, um, of, of its antiquity and heritage uh, itself. If we just come out of that, the other part of this is then being able to jump from a, a map of the CBD of Adelaide from 1905 using the Google Maps API. And this allows you to go straight to this area of Adelaide as it stands today. So you can map out these areas from an old map like that uh, straight into a contemporary view of that area today. I'm pretty sure they didn't have scooters in, in 1905. Um, not sure they probably had the idea though, uh, but um, here we go. That's uh, what the ways in which you can kind of geographically map uh, items between um, not only uh, places, but also periods of time as well. We look at the, um, this document view, for instance. What I wanted to show you here was just uh, an example of uh, what Recollect does it, uh, for, for the document type. It uh, 
provides you with an OCR, optical character recognition on ingest. Um, and the way that you can look at that is just by clicking straight over and you can see that on the right hand side there, the actual um, OCR layer there. And what this enables you to, to do then is um, edit this layer um, where, where there might be sort of inaccuracies uh, in it. You can see here that there's some kind of page or line breaks that you may not necessarily want. So we can just jump straight into there. Um, and let's say if we just move that up there, and add a little break there, and we can save that. And so with an old document like this, um, you can really start to um, tidy up and, and ensure that those OCR layers are um, are, are readable where the, where a document may not necessarily be. Uh, and of course, all of this um, text is immediately searchable uh, in the site. Of course, this uh, optical character recognition and the ability to edit that is particularly useful uh, in handwritten documents. Here's an example from Charles Darwin University who we're currently doing um, uh, implementation. Um, so where you um, have a handwritten document, it may not find all of that. And you can, as you can see with OCR, it's pretty much all gobbledygook. So what this enables you to do is to actually um, transcribe this document. So um, if I was just to add that first line, dear Peter, and then we can just save that. And of course, once that whole uh, handwritten document had been transcribed on the page here, all of that text then becomes immediately searchable in the site as well. So it's a really handy way of making accessible those old handwritten documents uh, so that they're searchable and that researchers can then um, find them, discover them, uh, and uh, use them in research papers and um, uh, articles and, and, and so forth. One of the other key functions to recollect is its ability to be able to um, showcase three-dimensional objects from the browser without having to download any third-party software. Uh, here's an example of um, uh, an Aboriginal uh, stone implement that was uncovered in a, an archaeological dig that took place when they knocked down the, the Royal Palais in Newcastle. Um, and they discovered this archaeological, um, this Aboriginal burial, burial site and they turned it into a dig and found all of these objects and then they scanned them as OBJ files which you can ingest into Recollect. And what this enables you to do um, is to just, um, if we just zoom out a little bit here, enables you to be able to then view that object in 3D. So particularly useful for researchers who might be interested in you know, shape, contour and colours and textures of uh, of an implement like this um, for research purposes. You can really zone in and come straight quite close in there. So if there's any anything that was stamped in there or any um, letters, you could see that as well. So a really handy uh, facility for researchers to view three-dimensional objects. And actually, they ended up doing a, uh, a project with the Comp Sciences Department where they developed um, a system working with the Oculus Rift headset uh, and that enabled you to be able to put on the headset and actually pick up these rocks from the Recollect site and handle them as if they're actually in the palm of your hand. So there's lots of collaborative opportunities, obviously, that can come out of uh, this as well. Geotagging um, and uh, finding locations on a map. And this is coming from the Archives of archives and History Resources at the, the City of Sydney. Uh, obviously, being a... Uh, an LGA, uh, they, they, you know, they really wanted a way to be able to view content um, on a geographical area. So this al allows you to actually do a search for particular items. So if you're in the LGA of Sydney, as, as I actually am, uh, you could, I'm, I'm not here though, um, you could actually have a look at a, an area uh, where you have, uh, in this instance, a, a, an art installation, the Botanic Gardens, um, and actually go and view that that item. And this is laid out in the metadata through the latitude and longitude points of these locations, and then they simply appear on the user map from that point onwards. So it's a way of mapping your content onto a user map so that it provides that uh, level of discoverability uh, for users who um, would, would like to be able to discover content in that way. Um, it's obviously a very visual way of uh, discovering content. 
Um, I thought this was uh, something that some of you might be interested in. Um, one of the great things with Recollect is that you can work with, I was just talking about the Google Maps API, um, but it also works with, with Matterport, Matterport software. And this is um, a, a three-dimensional walkthrough of uh, an art installation that a recent implementation that we did for Wesley College um, did. And what it allows you to do is just virtually walk into this uh, art exhibition and we'll just go to that painting right at the end there, have a look at it, maybe zoom back a little bit. Um, and then you can just simply have a look at the information that's related that, to that painting. Of course, you can walk around the room and see different other paintings as well. Really nice functionality. I said in the start that the linked data model is the way in which Recollect really bases um, how it links together your items. And that's one of the core, I'd say, features of Recollect, because it's one thing having items within uh, an archive or collection, but it's actually being able to link those items together to um, tell stories that are embedded uh, in the metadata of these uh, items. So with this model design, what you can do is you can, um, you know, you might start with a place or an event or a person. You start with a person, um, you'll see on that right hand side of the screen metadata that will link to a document or could link to a document um, about that person. This could be a vice chancellor, it might even be uh, a thesis or a, a book or a book chapter written by the vice chancellor. Um, there's information about the document there. Um, there then might be um, information related to um, the vice chancellor and that document in an oral history, perhaps that she uh, she did for the university before she left. I'm just making things up on the top of my head here, just providing examples. Um, that oral history might refer to an event, might be might have been the day that uh, the vice chancellor started or left. Um, that might link to a place which might have might be where she's from, the country she's from, or where she's born. And so in this way, it provides a way to link your metadata, as I was saying in the beginning there, to tell the stories that are embedded in your, um, in your collections. And a good way to demonstrate this is um, the uh, information, what we call an information item or information hub. Uh, here's uh, information about Cedric Ernest Hall, who's one of the uh, airmen who attempted that first England to Australia flight. Um, and what we see on the right hand side here is um, a series of links that take you through to items that are related to his attempted journey to Australia. Now, unfortunately, he, he met a, a mysterious death over Corfu on one of, one of his attempted trial runs. Um, and that prompted a letter from his father, um, George Matthews. Um, he wrote a pamphlet that was um, asking for an inquiry uh, over his son's death. Um, and then you can then link to, for instance, one of the successful airmen um, in uh, that first England to Australia flight. Uh, and then when you look at this information hub, you've got all of the uh, assets that are related to not only Cedric Ernest Howe, where we started, uh, we've also read about his untimely death and the inquiries that were requested about his death. But now we've landed on the page of the successful airman, and now we're looking at photographs of his journey to Australia in that first England to Australia flight. There's manuscripts, there's videos, publications, transcripts, objects, related people, related collections, and a knowledge page. So it really is a, a, a way to draw in and link items together so that um, they're all in one place, but they can all be looked at uh, individually as well. I'm going to talk about um, the uh, tagging, uh, tagging shortly. Timelines is a, another really nice way to demonstrate um, uh, information. Here we have uh, a timeline from the University of Adelaide. Um, the history of women at the university there. Um, you can kind of link, you can kind of jump through from uh, the timeline itself. Um, or you can use the top arrows there. A 
And of course, each of these items can be linked to the item itself within RecLEC. So if we jump from this part of the timeline, then we'll get information about um, Arabella Wright. And of course, again, you've got all of that um, metadata information on the right hand side. And look at all the uh, other links that you can jump to from this page. So you've started on a timeline. Now you might start looking at um, you know, her, her withdrawal from Canada from a, a junior examination and any controversy that might be surrounding that as well. So it just, again, just kind of reiterates that point of being able to tell stories through your metadata. Of course, Recollect is not only about um, digital collections, but it also handles the ability to um, uh, present records and physical collections. Here we have an example at the um, University of Waikato. Um, there's the um, William Henry Grace diaries. So if you wanted to actually um, look at this, um, one of the diaries, you could jump straight into the library management system at the University of Waikato uh, and put a date and your name in there and uh, uh, whether you're a student or not and, and make a time to go and see that, see that collection. Likewise with the University of, sorry, the um, City of Sydney Council, um, they've got a series of records which are really, oh, where's that gone to now? Oh. I don't know why it's, why it's not clicking through. Now you can see, see from the slide here the way in which this, this record, uh, this joint application for a building certificate, there's any number of those within, within the site. Um, so it can just house records themselves. All right, so um, let's look at uh, the ways in which you can make contributions. So here's an example. Um, oh, I see it's something that's, I'm gonna think I might, might have to jump out of my slides here a second because it's not bringing up the browser any longer for some that's reason. Right, Roger, I'm just, uh, just on that, I know we've still got a few things that you'd like to cover, but also just mindful of the time that we want to um, provide for, for Martha and Peer Chat as well. Yep. Um, if there wasn't something that we how, needed how to we, do. How, we, how are we doing for time? We've got half an hour left, and I think uh, Martha and Peach okay. had around about 20-odd minutes, which should leave us time for uh, questions at the end. Okay. Well, yes, I can finish up here. So just you know, suffice it to say that uh, you can tag and make those contributions, and any links within those tagged items can then link back to an item within the collection. You can see you can do that with your oral histories. Uh, just very briefly, um, you have your metadata template, which is mapped to that right-hand column, very easily uh, laid out. Um, and to summarise, it really is a you know comprehensive digital asset and collection management system, which is scalable to your future needs, uh, providing your scholarly community with a way to discover, access, engage with the collections. And uh, I think uh, thank you for pulling me up there, Richard. I tend to get a little bit carried away sometimes, very inspired by what Recollect can do. Um, so I think this is probably a really good time to hand over to um, Martha and uh, Piaget. So I'll just disable sharing here. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that, Roger. And I guess while we're uh, transitioning across, obviously there's a lot more to, to recollect than what Roger's been able to show. And we encourage anyone that um, wants to look further, we're very happy to convene a, you know, a personal private demonstration um, tailored to your own collection as well. So don't hesitate to um, to get in touch. and. So I guess we'll hand over now um, to Martha if um, to share with us your collection. Here we go. Uh, Martha is speaking. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with my colleague, Piaschat Ratana, and we are both digital collections librarians at the University of Sydney Library. We are a part of the digital collections team, which is a small team of only eight people. And we look after two repositories. One is the institutional research repository and the other is the digital collections repository. And that's the one we'll be focusing on today. Pai and I are very excited to have the opportunity to share one of our most unique collections with you, our library virtual staff art exhibition collection. And the Art Exhibition Collection is a sub-collection of our COVID-19 Cultural Heritage Collection. And that was created to capture the university community's experience during the pandemic. You'll see artworks from the Art Exhibition Collection sprinkled throughout our slides today. And this one here is the audience favorite, 
which is Virus by Monse Vega Montez. And we'll be sharing our experience of creating this sub collection with you today. So let's get started. First, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land I'm joining you from today. I'm currently on Gadigal land, and it is also upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney stands. We pay our respects to those who care, have cared for and continue to care for country. In our session today, we'll look at the steps that led up to the finalized library virtual staff art exhibition collection. More specifically, we'll be looking at the main COVID-19 collections, the virtual staff art exhibition event the library held, and the sub-collection that came from that event, the impact it has had and the place it holds within our collections. If you'd like to explore the sub-collection yourself, Pi is adding the link to it in the chat. And I'm now going to hand over to Pai, who will start things off by sharing a little more about the context for our COVID-19 collections. Thank you, Martha. Hello, everyone. Piachat is speaking. Can you believe it has been more than two and a half years since we first heard about COVID-19 and how our lives have changed so much? COVID-19 pandemic changes the way we live, the way we work, the way we interact with each other, the way we learn, study, and do research. Here at New South Wales, we went through several hard lockdown periods since March 2020. The restriction was extremely tough. We were restricted to travel, not allowed, um, only allowed for essential trips, including trips for food, medicines, doctor appointment, and vaccination. One person per household could go out at a time. No visitors, no events, no gatherings, and school moved to remote learning. Masks were mandated indoor and so on. It was like yesterday I remember so well. Life was different and very difficult. It wasn't just for grown-ups, but also hard for children. Even though the restriction was lifted, we are still experiencing the new normal. And as you know, the pandemic is not over yet. During the lockdown, university buildings were closed, no face-to-face -face classes, no on-site laboratory experiments, no field work. We entirely moved to online teaching and learning. University staff worked from home. We used Zoom and Microsoft Teams for back-to-back -back meetings. And yes, we were physically and mentally isolated and Zoom fatigue was introduced. No doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on the university community. Over time, this impact will comprise an important chapter in the university's history. So with the aim to capture what university life was like during the pandemic, the library led by our team, the digital collections team, initiated a project called Collecting COVID-19, resulting in two COVID-19 collections. The first one is the University of Sydney COVID-19 Research Collection. It is a collection of COVID-19 research related outputs that are produced by universities researchers. They are, for example, published article, preprints, and conference papers. The records are made available in the institutional repository, Sydney e Scholarship. This collection shows wealth and breadth of research work being done at the university during COVID-19 time. Right now, we have over 1,900 records published in Sydney e Scholarship Repository. And the link to this collection is added and promoted on the University Coronavirus Research and Expertise page. Move on to the second collection um, that we will focus on today is a cultural heritage co collection called the University of Sydney during COVID-19. It is a collection of digital content that reflects the impact of COVID-19 on the University of Sydney community and its response to the pandemic. We host this 
collection in Recollect, our digital collection repository. This is a collection of images, personal reflections, interviews, and more that were contributed by university staff and students to help document how the pandemic has affected university life, to capture the experiences of staff and students during the pandemic, and to document how education and work at the university have changed during COVID-19. Ideally, we are looking to provide a snapshot of how COVID-19 affected the university that can be used for research and teaching purposes, and also personal reflection <clears throat> and public interest. So both research and cultural collections are made openly available to everyone. We have been living history, and we also have been documenting this in different ways, like on social media, in personal diaries, and in photos on our phones. The University of Sydney during COVID-19 collection presents a unique opportunity for university staff and students to share what they have seen as a university community in person and across virtual pathways during this time. The collection is still open for donations. We accept content related to COVID-19 and the university. Let's just say we accept anything that will help uh, show experiences during the pandemic. Example of types of content we ask for, uh, as you can see in the, uh, in the list on the slide, Besides accepting donations uh, from the university members, we have also done our own curation work for this collection. An example is we curated audio, video interviews with members of the university community conducted by a group of undergraduate history students who were undertaking an independent research project. The group interviewed students, academics, uh, teaching staff, as well as the Deputy Vice Chancellor Education at that time. The other curation we did is the Library Virtual Staff Art Exhibition event, with, which Martha is going to talk about in a minute. The University of Sydney during COVID-19 collection was first released in October 2020. This is how the collection page looks like. At the moment, we have 100 plus items, including one sub-collection, which is the Library Virtual Staff Art Exhibition. So we have had some great content shared so far. Uh, let's have a look at a few of them. First example is personal reflection. Here is the letter uh, to the future from our university librarian, Philip Kent, discusses his journey from the University of Bristol to uh, Sydney during COVID-19. And second one is the artwork by a student reflecting how she felt so lonely during the lockdown. Next is the photo of the empty campus during the lockdown. It is picture perfect, but no one wishes to see this kind of emptiness. And we also have a lot of health posters around the campus. And last but not least, number of pets posts on social media, um, showing how much they loved and enjoyed online meetings with their owners. So now I'm going to hand over to Martha to talk about our special library virtual staff art exhibition sub-collection. Over to you, Martha. Martha is speaking again. So now that you all have a good understanding of the time and context of when this sub-collection was created, I'm going to go through the process involved with creating it. First came the actual art exhibition event. If we think back to early 2020, we were all coping with a lot of changes and uncertainty. Our library staff and well-being group, which is called SWAG, was concerned with how we could all support each other and stay connected and deal with the social isolation from the lockdown and having to work from home. 
And that's when Swag came up with the inaugural library virtual staff art exhibition. And that was in May 2020. It wasn't only an exhibition, actually. We also voted on our favorite artwork. And the idea was that everyone could get involved, even if they didn't contribute an artwork. The event, event was held via Zoom, and it had a great turnout. And a lot of artworks were entered into the exhibition, 32 in total. The exhibition kicked off with Swag sending out an email invitation for the event to all library staff. And they also asked anyone who wanted to contribute to upload their artworks to a Padlet with a short blurb to present it. The Padlet was up for a week before the event took place and the winner was announced um, at the event. And as I've already mentioned, that was virus. You can see it amongst the other ones here. Um, and this slide actually shows a pretty accurate representation of what the Padlet looked like. And if you look closely, you can see the little hearts on each contribution, and that's how we all voted. So that event formed the foundation for the sub collection, and I'll show you the process we went through to actually create it. It's also worth mentioning that the decision to archive the exhibition entries was made by the digital collections team. And as we started the curation process, we knew we were dealing with a special collection. The items were really personal and incredibly creative. And also they had been contributed by our colleagues. So that was new to us. As Pai has already mentioned, when we considered creating the main COVID-19 collections, we decided that this time period would likely become an important chapter in the university history. And so we should archive what we can from it and safeguard it for the future. So the decision to document our library staff members' experience was not very difficult. We knew it would also become an important part of the library's history. So the first step of the curation process was this appraisal to decide if the collection would be suitable for us, what it would bring to our current collections. Was it of interest and of relevance? And as I've just spoken about, we had already established that the COVID-19 collections were of interest, and we thought that the art exhibition collection would fit nicely among our current collections. It captured a slightly different aspect than the main COVID collections and had more of a focus on the library. I've tried to show you where they sit, um, each collection sits in this slide. So from the back, you can see that's our homepage for our digital collections. Then one jump out is the COVID-19 collection. And within that is the sub collection, the art collection, which you can see right at the front here in the bottom left hand corner. Now, since the items were only available in digital form, it was also clear that the logical place for them was within our digital collections. And the fact that the items were visually striking images and original artworks also suited us perfectly. We also knew the context and provenance well and could vouch for their authenticity since we also attended the event. Next, we considered the items themselves. Since we already have photographs and artworks in our collection, we knew we could archive and display them appropriately. Also, the metadata we required was already provided. The title and the description and the author had also been submitted with the image file for the exhibition event. We also know we could reach any of the contributors for more information and clarification if we needed to. And we did actually have to reach out to one person who had only submitted the title and we were able to follow up with them and get a description too. We also knew we'd easily be able to reach contributors to ask for permission to include their artwork in the sub collection, which we did via email. And of the 32 artworks entered into the exhibition, we got permission for 18 of them. We also thought we'd be able to present the sub collection in a meaningful way since we knew the contextual situation so well. The fact that the items came from library staff and was then captured by library staff gave a unique perspective and insight, even if it wasn't completely objective. Since the items already had the structure of a complete and cohesive collection from when they were displayed in the exhibition, we thought it would be good to keep that structure. So the event itself became an item of the heritage collection. And that's why we decided to make it a sub collection. Throughout the curation process, one of the most important realizations we had was that if we didn't preserve these items in a collection, they would quickly be forgotten. The art exhibition event served a purpose for staff at that time 
but its reach and lifespan could be expanded if we archived it within our collections. And next, I want to talk a little bit about metadata. When we were preparing for the bulk ingest, we had meetings within the team and with our colleagues in metadata services to discuss the metadata. And that was to ensure that it was both accurate and consistent. Some things were easy, such as the title and description for each item that was provided by the individual artist, as I've already mentioned. Um, but we did add a text to the bottom of each item's description, stating that it is a part of the University of Sydney during COVID-19 collection. And you can see that on the slide on the right hand side of the screen grab there. And that ensured that the context wasn't lost if someone did a general search instead of going by the collection homepage. As you can see, we also added a hyperlink which led to the collection homepage. This also meant that when harvested outside of our system, you could quickly see where the item came from. Beside the title and description, other things required more consideration. The date, for instance. We decided that the date for all items would be the deadline for submitting to the exhibition, since that was when the collection first became complete. Deciding on the type led to another discussion where, where we agreed on which items would be labeled as original artworks and which ones as photographs. So feel free to visit the collection and see what we decided on. An important part of our work when we prepare for um, a collection is to prepare the metadata and have these conversations with the metadata services team. It ensures we're all on the same page when it comes to our metadata, not just for our digital collections, but for all our collections across the library. We highly recommend cultivating this type of collaboration. The bulk ingest itself was completed following standard procedures, which I'm sure most of you would already be familiar with. But the final step is an important one to highlight today, and that was what we, when we made the library virtual stuff art exhibition collection a sub-collection. And we did, did that by editing the details of the collection item itself. So we added the name of the COVID-19 heritage collection to the collections field for the library virtual staff art exhibition. This effectively transformed the collection to a sub-collection that sits under the main COVID-19 heritage collection. And I've tried to show that on the current slide. So hopefully that makes sense, kind of. As for the impact of the sub-collection, in many respects, the library virtual staff art exhibition collection was made not only by library staff, but for library staff. Its impact is difficult to measure, but we like to think our colleagues look at these items with a sense of pride that it helps them remember how we came together and manage the impact of the lockdown. And we also think that those who contributed will be happy and proud to see their artwork will be available for everyone to see for a very long time. In terms of the impact on the general public, the sub-collection has provided a snapshot of the library's history during the pandemic, and maybe its personal touch can be even more engaging than our more research-based items. And anyway, the main COVID-19 research collection already has that covered. We do know that the external clients and organizations are interested in the work we have done here, and we have been contacted by people who want to know more, who want to do something similar, or who want to ask if they can link to our collections from their own web pages or directories. For us in digital collections, creating this little sub-collection was an easy and natural way to play our part in coping with the pandemic. But I think the real impact is difficult to judge at this point. It's just too soon. The true impact will only be known many years from now when there's some distance to it all and we have an opportunity to reflect back on this particular point in time. Finally, to round things up, we thought we would share a couple of lessons with you that we learned along the way. First, when repurposing items like this, it's important to consider how likely you are to get permission to display them. We were lucky that 18 out of 32 staff members gave permission, but not everyone wanted to make them public. There's a difference between sharing something in a social setting with your colleagues and making it public to everyone. In terms of curation, as I've already mentioned, it's worth considering how temporary our events and exhibitions are. It's worth asking, should this be archived and included in our collections? When we created this sub-collection, we definitely became aware, aware of how we can extend the lifespan and impact of the initial event. 
image quality was another consideration. When items are self-submitted, you lose some of the control over quality. And when they're submitted to a different system, you can lose control of the type of formats being submitted, since the requirements might not be the same for both platforms. In our case, we changed formats without difficulty, but ensuring consistent good quality was another, ma another matter. Some of the images were not of the greatest quality and not all contributors had the opportunity to take new photos. Some items had been given away and some, as with the Mandarin and the keto rolls, I would expect had already been eaten. We had to consider all items born digital and accept that the file we received was as good as it would get. We also decided not to crop or alter any of the images, both because we were trying to preserve how they had been featured during the exhibition event, and because we felt it would not be appropriate to change the look of a digital artwork that had been purposefully cropped and prepared by the artist when they submitted it. Finally, I want to again emphasize our collaboration with metadata services. We really appreciate the great collaboration we have with our metadata services team. We have regular meetings where we discuss metadata issues across our digital collections, and this keeps our focus on metadata front and center. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it at that. So that's it from us. And Pine, I will be happy to try and answer any questions you have. And I also feel free to contact us on library.digitalcollections at sydney.edu.au. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you uh, very much for that, Martha and Pietra. Um, just looking in the list of questions, so if anyone does have uh, questions for either Roger and the, and the Recollect product or for um, both Martha and Peachat, please put it into the chat. We do have one question um, there already from Anna Clatsworthy from University of Melbourne just asking as to whether you can customise, uh, sorry, whether or not you can allow users to edit the OCR file, so whether to turn that on or off. And Roger, perhaps um, I can direct that question to you. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, you can determine who edits the uh, OCR layers, um, and that can all be turned off in the back end of the site. But you can also provide um, access to users to edit the, those OCR layers for a period of time as well. Great. Thank you. And I can see Lachlan is typing something. It hasn't appeared yet. Oh, that's thanks, Anna. Oh, I thought I did see somebody else was typing something there. Oh, there we are, from Lachlan, uh, who's also from the archives at the University of Melbourne. Uh, can the metadata about the relationship between records, people, events, etc., be stored within the relationship? I'm not sure if I understand that query, but Roger? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand it either. I mean, essentially, and, you know, my may be able to speak to this in relevance to the um, art collection that they've developed but the metadata that you create um, is uh, displayed on the right hand side of the screen um, and that is stored within recollect um, it's structured by the item templates that you develop uh, and, and martha and Chat may have been part of the um, creation of their templates uh, once upon a time when when it was first implemented um, but essentially, the, the, the metadata is displayed on the right-hand side. It's stored in spreadsheets, so you can download from those items as well. Um, I, I don't know if I've answered that question as, as it was written, but uh, there's a number of different things to think about there, maybe. So, yeah, Lachlan's just come back and said, for example, if two people are, are related as spouses, can you specify the period during which they were related? Yes, you can, yep. Yeah, that would just be an additional metadata field for right. um, duration. Yeah, correct. Um, all right, just going back up, Chris McCauley um, just asking, can you say more about Recollect being placed in a kiosk mode for physical access? And look, I guess I'll probably answer um, that one. Recently we were at um, the Vala Library Conference and we had a touchscreen um, on our stand there and had the Recollect on it. So Recollect is... Um, is a web based it's like it's uh, accessed through a, a web interface um, and using a standard touch screen you can access it. it it doesn't have a kiosk mode as such or a interface designed specifically for a um, uh, a touch screen kiosk but through the traditional web interface uh, displayed on a kiosk you can so it does have some limitations in that um, 
you're using your finger to use the touch screen and access it like you would with a mouse on a um, on a web page. Um, so yes, you can, but um, it, it is basically through that uh, web interface. Uh, Anna's again asked, can you confirm that the files are OCR'd on ingest and, and can you also ingest the plain text or alto file if we already have OCR'd the item? And uh, Roger. Uh, um, yes. Uh, ingesting items uh, in the document um, item type, um, they are ingested, uh, uh, they are OCR'd on ingest. Uh, but there's also the PDF item type, which allows you to ingest items that already have that OCR embedded, whatever type of documents they are. Yep, very good. And I think I've got somebody else, just Catherine, typing a message here at the moment. Uh, well, well, Catherine's typing. I've got a question for Martha in the peer chat. Um, you mentioned that not all of the collections um, that you received or the items that you received for that collection were... Uh, put up on the site eventually but my question to you is are you still holding them and are they still archived but just not visible because that's one of the other features of recollect is that you can obviously still archive items that just aren't visible to the public and i wondered if you still included them as part of that uh covid 19 uh, collection um i'm happy to answer that if you like quite so um they are um, archived in our, our regular um, archive, so on our network drives, but they're not archived wow. in Recollect. And that is merely due to the fact that because the event was held um, without um, us being planning to create a collection, it was important to us when we reached out that that was completely voluntary, whether it can be integrated in the collections or not. I'm not sure if you want to add to that pie. It was a little bit before my time but that's my understanding of it so um so it, they've not been uploaded um but yeah. they are saved within um the library's network drives separately yeah. but not as part of this collection yeah. so martha i think i've got a question um here for you from catherine Lindsay at uh, monash university just asking as to what other systems um that you use at the university that perhaps integrates with recollect uh, and of course, if if any, um, that integrate with Recollect. I guess I like the complete hours. I would I would have to take that take that on notice and actually look at that. That is more um, Kim Williams area. So I'm happy to look into that for you, Catherine, and and get back to you. Um, but I I would not be able. to. Pi, do you have any um, insight on that? Uh, not that I know of, but uh, we actually have the OAI PMH harvesting to trough and also our library Primo. So that would be, yeah, the system that... It's, it, it's certainly possible to do that. Mm. Yeah. So Catherine's also then asked, you know, and in general, do you only upload files to Recollect if they are to be available for discovery? So I guess in, in essence, is, is Recollect your primary... Um, discovery layer for your digital assets? Uh, for cult cultural collections, yes. And that Recollect is the only uh, system that we have. Yeah. But it, it rather speaks to that other question that, uh, you know, you don't need to see Recollect as necessarily something that you can display everything to the public. And indeed, particularly with Indigenous collections or other types of collections, there may well be donors who don't want to be, um, don't want the items to be viewed through Recollect or online. Um, there's any number of reasons why you might you might still archive something in Recollect but not show it to the public. There might be a record there of that item in which someone could go and view that item, as I showed you in that example of the Waikato, University of Waikato. And that is, uh, just to clarify as well, that is a functionality we, we use in Recollect for, uh, for some of our collections as well. But for, like I said, this is a pretty unique collection, the library staff art yeah. exhibitions. So for that one, we have mm -hmm. not, but, but certainly that is um, something we've done for other collections. Excellent. Look, we are right on the hour and there is one last question. So we'll, we'll answer that. And that's um, got us right on the exact time of an hour. Um, and so that's come from Lachlan as well, just in relation to the OAI uh, PMH functionality. And does it support, Roger, for, I guess, question to you, deletions or withdrawals um, as well? Uh, well, you can certainly um, uh, configure within Recollect what you wish, what metadata, what metadata you wish to be harvested or not. 
Yeah, okay. So, so if you would, delete metadata that you don't want to be harvested, it won't be harvested. Yeah. And I, I guess, Lachlan, maybe the, the query might have been as to whether it had been already published out there once and now you wish to withdraw it. I'm not sure whether um, simply then changing that in Recollect would reverse that on the yeah, system you're sharing sure. with, but we can, um, I'll, I can pick that up offline with you later and, um, uh, and, and discuss that further. And I guess just to that for everyone else and just in wrapping up today, um, as I had mentioned before, we only very briefly gave you a quick glimpse of Recollect for those who haven't seen it before. We would welcome the opportunity for you to get back in touch um, and arrange to have a, a private or personal demonstration with Recollect. So please don't hesitate to do that. Um, again, I'd really like to thank both Martha and Peter Chat for coming along today and supporting uh, us with uh, today's presentation and webinar um, and really showcasing what you've done there with your um, COVID-19 collection and, and sub-collections. It's um, greatly appreciated. So thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And of course, thank you to everyone else that, um, that came on board and um, or joined us today for the webinar. Um, just as an update to that, we will send out a, a thank you to everyone and um, we'll include in there a link um, to the University of Sydney site so that you can, I know Pete Chat has put it in the chat here, but we will um, include that in our email so that you can go in and have a look through that collection and of course have a look through all of their other um, uh, digital assets there as well. So thank you all very much and um, we look forward to uh, hopefully speaking with you again sometime uh, in the future. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye.